effortless interaction between humans and today's computer systems is something most of us take for granted. Okay, Google, how long will it take me to get to Best Buy in Secaucus? On your way to Best Buy, traffic is light as usual. It is 22 minutes by car. Alexa, what time is it? It's 3.28 p.m. If you've used any mobile or desktop device, or made any call to a company or organization with an automated phone system, then you've benefited from the field of human-computer interaction, or HCI. The technologies behind HCI have been in development since the 1930s. Well, we've heard the voter make a word, and by combining words, of course, we get a sentence. For example, Helen, will you have the voters say, she saw me? Uh... That sounded awfully flat. How about a little expression? Say the sentence in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Well, did she see you or hear you? She saw me. The other half of computer voice technology is the synthetic speech. The Robertson Greeting Card Company. Coltex from Speech Plus is a text-to-voice simulator that turns ASCII input into speech. GTE of California and Michigan Bell have embraced the idea for rapid database retrieval when clarity is more important than the subtleties of intonation. I don't know the word is later. Is it a noun, an adjective, an adverb, or should I ignore this sentence? Noun. Science fiction fantasies are one noun. thing. But at AT&T Bell Labs, scientists have developed one of the world's most sophisticated robots, a machine that comprehends and responds to the human voice. I don't know the word green. How close is science fiction to becoming science fact? Okay, it's the green tall hard rectangular block. I knew that, just checking. After nearly two decades of experimentation, the promise of voice recognition technology is at hand. The first application may soon be no farther away than the nearest telephone. One of the pioneers of human-computer interaction is someone you've probably never heard of. Her name is Katherine Wolf. Starting in the 1970s, Kathy Wolf helped teach computers to learn how we humans communicate. As a research psychologist, she designed and tested interfaces between people and machines. Speech to data, handwriting to type, and more. At Bell Labs and IBM, Kathy studied how verbal cues translate into meaningful information, and her work led to technologies like an automated teller system that allowed customers to do their banking remotely. Someday, banks and other businesses will get help from a new computer that lets customers pay their bills over the telephone. This ingenious computer not only verifies your identity, it can talk in plain English. I think I'm hearing, don't you like me? Listen. Don't you like me? Shouldn't the phrasing be more like, don't you like me? Mm, you're right. It's the T followed by a Y sound. Let's modify it now. At Bell Labs, engineers and scientists are busy teaching a computer how to speak your language so that someday you may be able to talk on the phone with a computer in plain English to get faster, more economical directory assistance and voice verification when banking by phone. Okay, let's hear it. Don't you like me better now? Oh, that's good. But for the past 20 years, Kathy Wolf has had an entirely different relationship with the technologies she helped to develop. In the late 1990s, she was diagnosed with ALS, a myotrophic lateral sclerosis, known to many as Lou Gehrig's disease. ALS causes progressive loss of motor functions until, one by one, the body systems shut down. There is no cure for ALS, and patients usually survive just a few years after diagnosis. But Kathy has defied the odds and lived much longer than most with the disease. To communicate, she relies on a special computer system that she controls with her eyebrows. Kathy has even turned her disease into a tool, uncovering new insights into HCI for individuals with disabilities. When I was a postdoc at MIT, I learned about ELISA, 
one of the first computer programs to interact with humans in a seemingly intelligent way. Then at Bell Labs in the early 1980s, I worked on the very first cell phone. It was so big and expensive, we thought only traveling salespeople would use it. At that time, speech recognition could only be done on a bulky mainframe. I didn't envision the cell phones of today. In the 1980s, Kathy joined the IBM T.J. Watson Research Center, where she began developing tools to augment human-computer interaction. My early work at IBM was on using gestures, like proofreader's marks, as a user interface and for collaboration. I led a team that made an exhibit for the Smithsonian Information Age exhibit. With a colleague, I invented the first gesture-based system for collaboration called WeMet. It is similar to present-day smart boards. Gesture recognition at that point was really uh, being able to, let's say, do editing of a document using, rather than um, doing, um, you know, pressing a key, using, you know, some kind of mark, some kind of typographical mark that you might use to indicate, you know, uh, get rid of this paragraph or insert something here or something like that. So it was really, and eventually I think she moved into sort of the extension of that, which was handwriting recognition. Kathy soon turned her attention to a new system she called the Conversation Machine. It was designed to let people carry out basic transactions in conversational language using a telephone-based interface. You know, one, of, one of the hallmarks of a good researcher is to pick important problems, and Kathy, Kathy did that. Um, she was, I think she had a good, good nose for what were the important things to work on um, and uh, where, you know, where she should be investing her, her time. Speech recognition, which is um, when, when people speak to a computer, taking that audio and translating it into text, whether, whether that text is a command to the computer or dictation, so, so that you, know, you can essentially write a report by simply speaking. She did a lot of the uh, original studies that try to, to understand what, what does it mean for a human being to interact with a computer in this way because it was, it was unplowed ground. And so her, I know that her, her reputation and background was in the speech recognition area. Speaking. It's one of the most natural things we do. It's also the basis of a remarkable research project at IBM. This is an experimental computer system that recognizes what I say. I talk and my words appear on the computer screen. We had two applications, the banking system and a system to help customers choose a personal computer. I was the user interface expert I figured out the different ways people might say things and tested the system. We used IBM's speech recognition and natural language understanding that were eventually showcased in Watson's appearance on Jeopardy. Watson, who is Franz Liszt? You are right. What is violin? Good. Who is the church lady? Yes. <laughs> Watson. What is narcolepsy? You are right, and with that, you move to $36,681. So I wasn't at first working directly with Kathy, but her reputation was, was really outstanding. She was considered the consummate analytical scientist and very, very objective. Uh, and she was, I think, viewed as a resource to many people in the research division, and certainly was to me uh, early on as I got into human-computer interaction. Well, Kathy uh, clearly was the expert in this area within IBM Research. Uh, if you had a question, if you needed to understand how certain technology can translate into yeah, how the 
person, the people uh, you that Kathy was the person to go to. Um, she, she has um, many years of expertise in this area, but also she had um, that gift, um, you know, and, and being able to, to explain things in a way that, you know, people can understand them, can relate to. Um, scientifically speaking, she could keep up with a lot of um, you know, topic uh, within the research community. So she, she really was on top of her game throughout. I remember when we were younger, we would sometimes test the things that she was working on, which was really fun. Like she worked on um, a voice recognition software. So we had it on our phone before, you know, people now, everyone has it now, but we would pick up the phone and say, call dad at work or, call whoever and you'd hear your voice say that you pre-recorded um, which we were kind of just testing it out that was always cool and to try to get it to say like have the dog bark and see who it would call <laughs> um, and then I remember another um, she worked on uh, the voice to type right so um, she would she would re she would say something um, type per emails like talk of them and and it would often change my name to Clorox or larva which I did not like that one <laughs> and then um, and then whenever she said love ya it changed it to Columbia so to this day that's we usually sign emails Columbia and and that means love ya. So I met Kathy, interestingly, um, in, in a way that had nothing to do with work. Uh, we were both runners and working in Hawthorne, and I would see her occasionally when I went out during lunchtime for a run. And we would talk about running and, and exercising, and I remember one of my first recollections was that she started having some difficulty. Um, and uh, there was some kind of persistent numbness uh, and, uh, in, in her leg that she couldn't quite figure out and obviously that was the, begin the very early beginning of the, the onset of uh, ALS. Figuring out I had ALS was a long road. I had sensory symptoms not typical of the disease. I thought it might be Lyme's and I had IV antibiotics. I didn't progress as fast as is typical. I went to Columbia University's ALS Center many times, Johns Hopkins twice, and finally Beth Israel in Boston, where they said I had a smoldering case of ALS. I knew ALS was a possibility much earlier than the final diagnosis my mother accompanied to Beth Israel. We hugged each other and cried. Well, that was a kick in the face. Um, a big kick in the face. God, it's hard to remember all the possible things that could have been at one point. We're praying it wasn't MS, and then we're praying it was MS. And eventually, I would say about a year after the symptoms first started. We had, by process of elimination, a uh, um, a verdict. It was a diagnosis which you can't get worse than. Uh, and um, so the fun began. And I had gone with her to a couple of her appointments and People weren't really saying ALS right away. Um, by the time that they did, I had sort of taken on full on like doing tons of research and doing a lot of writing about ALS. Like I was, I was an undergraduate, so I was writing about the genetics of ALS and genetics classes. I was in creative nonfiction classes writing about, um, you know, my experience of, of watching her decline um, and really trying to take control as much control as I could by trying to understand it more. So I was in high school 
when she first started getting sick. Um, I actually have a memory that my dad, he had heart surgery, and I remember being in the hospital um, after his bypass surgery. I must have been, I don't know, maybe a junior in high school, and, um, and he was recovering and she I remember her saying something about how she was having trouble moving her leg and I remember thinking like mom we're we're able to focus on dad right now but then I was definitely a freshman in college and I remember being in my dorm room when um when they called and said that it was definitely that it was ALS I remember looking it up online and um the life expectancy, you know, that you read online is one to three years, so um, it was just too real. And, um, to their credit, no doctor told me I had to two five years to live. There is a coping mechanism in which the typical patient afflicted with a disease thinks at the outset she or he will fare better than the typical patient. I had this attitude. There is not a typical case of ALS. I'd describe my case as slowly losing the use of my legs, my arms, my ability to swallow, and finally my ability to breathe, while my mind remained sharp as ever. So at that time, she must have been working for this guy, Stephen Boyce, who was our DGM, who has since retired. And his take was, um, that you know he will make it possible for her to do whatever she wants to do however she wants to handle it if she wants to leave and re retire she wants to go on disability she wants to keep working whatever it was that she wanted to do he was going to make sure that she was able to do and i i was really you know i i really respected him for that and i really you know i'm, I'm very grateful for him and that was really sort of for me um sort of the best of ibm in that he would have that kind of reaction, right? So it was like whatever she wanted to do, and what she wanted to do was to keep coming in. Uh, as her manager, uh, you know, I was acutely aware of what was happening, and, uh, you know, she would come to work, uh, she would be in a walker, and eventually, uh, you know, eventually she was having very, very serious difficulty. Um, but she really managed to um, just stay focused. She, she had a, a level of determination and intensity about her from the very beginning that was a marvel to see. Um, she already had started um, you know, suffering from the illness and she was already uh, you know, kind of um, suffering from it in terms of not being able to um, to walk straight and, and, and needing you know assistance but that didn't prevent her from you know getting on the plane flying with us to, to Minneapolis at no time have we felt that she was ill or I mean you could see it right because she was walking slow or she was walking with a cane but at no point have we felt that she was um, you know suffering from this she, she would she would hide it very well and again uh, her intellect is, is has continued to be so sharp that you know it's 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 very impressive to see that uh, despite all the physical difficulties that she was having already at that time you couldn't see it she actually already had ALS but she had to speak at a conference in Edinburgh and she needed someone to help her out going there and I think she wanted to have like a special trip too so she and I went to this conference of hers in Edinburgh, Scotland and then we went to Paris um, for a trip um, and I got to sit in on her talk and like you know be with her colleagues and see how they all interacted and I mean it was remarkable um, you know I didn't really know at that point that she was so highly sought after. But I remember coming home to visit from Boston, and and every time I came home, she would definitely be weaker. Like she had a walker for a while, and she would do laps around the the kitchen and the living room. And um, like I'd come home, and she could do two laps, and then the next time I came home, she could only do one lap. And and the next time, my dad had to you know help her into bed, and so. It, at the beginning, um, 
there was definitely, she, she got worse kind of, you know, quickly. And she continued to work and uh, people knew me and the, the women in uh, IBM research knew me quite well because the, I was a popular feature in the ladies room um, <laughs> at IBM because I would help her go to the bathroom. Finally, she fell at IBM, uh, broke her nose. Um, they gave her a, an aid to work with us, to help her in her office. She was really losing her ability to type and such. And um, they continued to let her work uh, for quite a while. And uh, eventually it became obvious that she'd have to stop. The cruelest loss was the loss of speech after a bad night. I found myself on my back in the emergency room of Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. I was faced with the question of whether to have a tracheostomy, a procedure that allows you to breathe with a ventilator and also makes breathing on your own easier. The question wasn't if. The question was whether this was the right time. The ALS team tried to convince me it was the right time. I remember the nurse practitioner, a longtime member of the team, said that refusing would be like writing do not resuscitate on my chart. I asked, will I be able to go to Erica's graduation in Boston early in June? The answer was yes. I had researched the changes that tracheostomy would bring, and I just wanted to delay them a few months. My husband Joel held my hand and whispered, it's really time. I decided, better six months early than six months late. I took the biggest breath I could and said, yes. I am optimistic by nature. I decided to live with ALS rather than die with it. And because she was proactive, partly also because she was a human computer interaction specialist and um, she could uh, um, deal with the new um, difficulties uh, by finding the appropriate software and uh, using that software properly on her computer she really was able to keep going. Today, Kathy has no volunteer muscle function except for a few muscles in her face, but she can manipulate a computerized communication system with her eyebrows. With this system, Kathy can interact with the world, even after 20 years with ALS. I get up at 10, get to the computer by one, do email, then I work on my poetry class, or I work on an article, update my Facebook fan club, or check my personal Facebook. At 10 I watch TV, usually news or the daily show. While I watch TV, the nurse does evening care. I am in bed between 11.30 and midnight. The thing about Kathy is that she I don't know, she always sort of made the best of whatever situation she was in. And, um, you know, that's always been Kathy. I mean, she's always, she's continued to be very involved in, in life, whether her personal life or her professional life or her, um, you know, her community life, right? And I visited her at home uh, at, at a point uh, where she, from all objective, um, evidence wasn't able to move at all. Um, I couldn't really understand how she was controlling uh, the, the cursor on the screen or pressing the mouse because the movements were almost imperceptible to me, but she was doing it and using it to communicate back and forth to me. And at the same time, I knew that she was using the same 
technique to continue to write papers. It was, it was astounding. So she is very interested in understanding about ALS and in contributing to the knowledge of, of the disease and, and also to really, I mean she has a lot of, I think she has a number of friends on, through Facebook who do have ALS and she's very, you know, active in, you know, in trying to help people with, um, you know, to, to, to live with it. My activity with other people who have ALS is issue-based like the recent FDA hearing on ALS drug development. I also check the patientslighten.com ALS forum at least once a month to see if I can add anything. I will always try to help someone who asks me. In addition to her advocacy work, Kathy has continued to contribute to ALS research. In 2009, she scored just 1 out of 48 on a rating scale that tested for motor function in ALS patients. But Kathy knew she had abilities the scale wasn't measuring. So, with researchers from an organization called Patients Like Me, Kathy painstakingly developed and tested new items to rate motor function in patients with advanced ALS. In my career, I wrote more than 100 research articles. I have six patents. But of all the research I have done, I am most proud of this. Kathy has also helped scientists with an experimental system that lets patients who can't move or speak control digital and mechanical systems with only their thoughts. We are continually trying new algorithms and new applications for my brain computer interface, or BCI. I mostly make suggestions about the user interface. One thing I remember clearly was her eyes. And as she was talking to me, there was, the word that comes to mind is ferocity. Her eyes, she was working hard to control the cursor and to get one letter at a time out in order to have a conversation with me. And it was that same intensity and ferocity that um, carried her through all of the, uh, you know, the work that she continued to do. So it was, um, it, what, she's a, you know, a staggering uh, individual from the per perspective of strength and, and perseverance. She's not somebody who's going to sit around and complain. She's really going to figure out what the next thing is. And I think that that sort of, that, that kind of, I don't know, attitude and that kind of strength is really what's driven her to, you know, continue picking up new interests. And, and to continue, you know, just continue with her life. And that's, that's remarkably, uh, it's remarkable and it's just very inspirational and, you know, to me and I think to a lot of people. I don't think of myself as disabled. After so many years, this is the new normal. But when my grandchildren visit and Joel plays with them in ways I can't, I am sad. Also when I go out and I am always the most disabled. Sometimes I think, why me? Most of the time, I focus on what I can't do, not what I can. Okay, I would say, it's harder on the person who gets the disease, but it's virtually insane for the person who is the spouse uh, because the demands are really real. When you get married, um, you say all those vows and uh, they're just words. And eventually, um, they're not just words and they really, you know, sickness and health and all of that stuff, uh, they mean something. I wouldn't recommend it.
There's no way I would recommend being an ALS spouse to anybody, but um, we didn't get choices. Kathy didn't get any choices, and I didn't get any choice, so you deal with it. 78 breaths per minute, 8, not dead yet. A great cat remains faithful, curled at my feet or stretched long on my body. His furry warmth comforts me through gnawing nightmares and the loneliness of 3 a.m. He knows without knowing the kindness of touch. I started writing poetry after I went on long-term disability. I guess my interest in poetry is related to my fascination with all aspects of language, rhyme, meter, different ways of saying things. I am not too active on Facebook these days, but you know, some of her poem made her their way uh, to me to my mailbox. Sometimes she, uh, yeah, it's uh, she, 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 she continued to kind of try to be creative and 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 do things um, you know that will keep her sharp and keep her going and uh, not let that get in the way. I think a lot of people um, who get this. Uh, diagnosis say okay um, party's over basically but Kathy did not want it to do her in and she would make those statements very very clear that she was going to find a way to keep going it wasn't going to um, finish her off and she would say, basically, ALS is not a death sentence. Yeah, no, she's amazing. It's really remarkable. I mean, I think when I think about her longevity with ALS, I think like, okay, like part luck, part really terrific nursing care, and part sheer determination, which you can see in the lineage from like as far back as I know, personally, you know, my grandparents to her, or to me, to my son even, um, you can see the sheer determination to do difficult things. Through it all, Kathy Wolf continues to be an inspiration for patients living with ALS, for women in technology, and for anyone who can appreciate her struggles and her incredible will to live each day to the fullest. I fight for many things. In the future, I hope the world will become a fairer, kinder, more peaceful place. I hope terrible diseases like ALS and cancer will be cured. And I hope my kids and grandkids and other family members will be happy, whatever that means for them.